the first phase i'm going to cover five sessions first session uh, today we will be covering two session and tomorrow there will be three sessions so first uh, first session which is on global minimum taxation i would like to welcome shri rakesh nangia who is a co chairman of socm national council on international taxes and chairman of nangia anderson india private limited we also have eminent experts panelists for this session uh, so i welcome mr vikas vasal co chairman national council on diet taxes of socm and global leader of taxation grand total international limited i also welcome other other panelists mr k bala subramanian vice president and global head of corporate taxation with pro so before i would request nange ji i would uh, also request the participants to kindly have your active participation and keep posting your queries in the question and answer box which would be answered by the expert uh, over experts after the discussion gets over So without wasting any more time, I would like to request Sri Rakesh Nagarjee to kindly take the things forward in this session. Over to you, sir. Uh, sir, you are uh, you kindly unmute yourself. Good evening, every everyone. Thank you for joining this session where we are going to have a very very interactive discussion today on the nuances on global minimum tax pillar 1 pillar 2 combined together and we'll be very happy to receive your questions and support them and we'll try our best to re reply to them as close as today itself and in case because of shortage of time we can't do that we'll definitely come back to you in writing friends with change in the business dynamics and digitization of economies the traditional taxation principles of cross border transactions based upon brick and mortar economy has started crumbling also the concept of p which is which is necessarily based upon physical presence will become redundant slash obsolete in the near future due to the technological development and the pe rules are being rewritten and i perceive that there is a limited shelf life of traditional pe concepts business can be carried virtually as a business can shift the income seamlessly across jurisdiction to minimize the tax burden by ridiculously complex tax planning structures with the sole intention to avoid or minimizing payment of taxes moreover increasingly income from intangible sources such as drug patents software royalties ip has migrated all these to the low tax jurisdiction allowing companies to avoid payment of higher taxes in the home countries and the latest in the search for ways to make mne pay taxes in the location where they earn the income is the concept of global minimum taxes which has been initiated by us and is indeed finding support from the policy makers across the globe just let me take you briefly the recent initiative of oecd and g20 the breakthrough actually came as just two months back on july 1st 2021 when 131 out of 139 members of inclusive framework on peps representing more than 90% of global gdp released a statement suggesting a two pillar solution to address the tax challenges arising from the digitalization of the economy the statement proposes a two pillar approach we have been talking about it we have been reading about it i'm just going to take you run you very briefly on it the pillar one is about relocation of additional share profit in the market jurisdiction say like country like india and pillar two is propagating a minimum global corporate tax rate of 50% and the benefit once pillar one and two are implemented will lead to a stabilization of the international tax system and the increased tax certainty for the taxpayer and the tax administration in fact india joined the oecd g20 inclusive framework and issued a press release the next day that was on july 2nd and said india is in favor of the consensus solution which is simple to implement simple to comply but at the same time a solution should result in allocation of meaningful and repeat about meaningful and sustainable revenue to market jurisdiction particularly for developing and emerging economies this was the quote unquote 
was said by it's an India statement, official statement. And this is likely to change the rules of international taxation globally. Not only this, many countries will be forced to change the domestic tax law governing corporate taxation. Very briefly, these international initiatives of taxation of digital economy, the inclusive framework here, and read a policy note that is, as I said, a two pillars again. One is on nexus and profit allocation, and second is ensuring a minimum level of taxation. And these two pillar approach has two prolonged strategy to ensure that MNE pay their share of taxes in all the country where they operate, and they bring stability and certainty to the international tax system. Friends, before I go back and put specific questions to my colleagues, to my panelists, learned panelists. One important thing that regarding two pillar approaches is it applies to all the companies, not digital company, subject to threshold. The entire debate started with digital economy and how we graduated and moved to the next level as the entire economy is becoming digital. Now you cannot bring fence the digital economy. So it applies to everybody. This is important, my friends, we need to note it. So my first question, Bala, I'm finding something just a generic question. This is a very ambitious timeline has been set by the government to implement this favor. It is hoped that by next month, October, the remaining technical work on the two pillar approach will be completed for effective implementation by 2023. My simple question is, do you believe this timeline will be met? I believe the multitude of hard work is still in pipeline. And just what baffles me, it has been eight years since the BEPS Action 1 was launched, initiated actually. And to this, we are not close to the fruition. If it happens in 2023, it is 10 years. That's really historical. What challenges do you see, Prana Fesi, just to kickstart the discussion on the implementation of this? Bala to you. Thanks. Thanks, Rakesh. And uh, uh, you know, thanks uh, to Asocham for this opportunity uh, to share our thoughts here. Uh, Rakesh ji, you know, to to you know, step into your question straight away. It's an ambitious uh, timeline, no doubt about it. Uh, but we also talked about ambitious timeline even when the MLI uh, came into existence. And but with uh, uh, you know uh, with the dexterity that the countries progressed on the MLI, uh, in my view, nothing looks unachievable uh, in this world. Uh, of uh, you know countries which are which are cooperating with each other to work towards a common goal right and uh, we saw that in mli we saw that in multiple uh, you know action plans being Im implemented in beps uh, of course the timeline is very very uh, aggressive but if not in you know the timeline that they have mentioned uh, we will have some light at the end of the tunnel at least from a government perspective uh, in respect of these digital taxation uh, you know, as you rightly pointed out, you know, we what started off with digital taxation has come to stay uh, for, uh, you know, the larger uh, industry. And then that's what is going to happen because what was digital at the time BEP started, right? And what is digital today has taken, you know, a huge leap, right? And it has, it, the, the world has changed between 2000 and now or 2010 and now. And I don't think the world is going to be remaining status quo between now and 2025. And 25 is not very far away. It's just, you know, four years away. Things will change. So therefore, you know, I don't think there is any affordability to have this policy lingering for a long time from governments of, uh, you know, the, the government's perspective, it is important for them to uh, roll up their sleeves and get to an understanding that will also give certainty to the business. Right? And what we are looking at is certainty. And if, if there is certainty of implementation and the certainty of policy, uh, we will all align with it. And uh, earlier is better uh, than later. Thank you, Bala. It's, it's good to see the optimism like this. And I agree with you on this matter. It's better to be late. Enough time has gone. And hopefully we see the light of day in 2023. Because one of the things, this exercise is going on for 10 years. Is there any global estimate of the loss of tax revenue due to the profit shifting? I just want to understand the gravity of it, actually. So there have been various reports, Rakesh, on this subject, and uh, there have been different versions of that. But broadly, the consensus is 
because of the variation in the corporate tax rates in different tax jurisdictions, there is a revenue leakage or revenue loss of anywhere between $100 billion to $250 billion. Now, this figure is large enough to instigate interest amongst the political masses and also add to that the issues which the global economies are facing. In fact, they started facing pre-pandemic and after pandemic where the governments are pushing literally the revenue authorities for larger revenue collections. So uh, I think uh, these figures are sufficient enough to instigate political interest to push for the consensus and go ahead uh, answering to you, uh, adding to the first question that you asked. I think while there will be a lot of challenges, but there is a larger political consensus on this right now. Because I have one more question to ask. Is this 100 to 250 billion is for the entire BEPS project or it is only on GMT global minimum taxes pillar one and two? Any idea, any survey has been done or some figures are there for India or for global? So OECD had commented on that a few years back and their estimate was that because of the uh, difference in the tax rates, this is the amount of leakage which is happening. So it's primarily because of the variation in the corporate tax rates in different tax jurisdictions, especially vis-a-vis -vis the tax-friendly jurisdictions that we have. Okay, okay, thanks. Friends, let me just take you to the next level. Uh, this was a genetic discussion. We have been talking about Pillar 1 from last six months. I'm trying to put some different perspective today in our discussion. Pillar 1 is aimed in ensuring a fairer distribution of profit and taxing rights among countries with respect to the largest MNEs, including digital companies. So what is expected to do? It is would reallocate some of the taxing rights over MNEs from the home countries to the markets where they have business activities and where they earn profit, regardless whether they have a physical presence or not. This is a new change when I was saying about the beginning about the P definition of redefining. So under Pillar 1, the largest and the most profitable multinationals will be required to pay taxes in the country where they operate and not just where they have their headquarters. And the rule will apply to global firms with at least a 10% profit margin and will see 20 to 30% of profits above 10% margin reallocated and then subject to tax in the countries that they operate. Further, this is applicable for companies having a turnover of 20 billion euros and profitability of about 10 billion percent. And this is likely to be reduced to 10 billion after seven years. And if the MNEs has a turnover of less than a 1 billion euro, the country will not get pillar one tax. My Bala, I come back to you again. What happens if the profit is less than 10 percent? I have three, four continuous questions on this subject. First, I want to know that. Bala? Yeah, yeah. Ra Rakesh ji, yeah, you know, if the profit is less than 10%, then there are, uh, you know, the other rules which will uh, kick in, right, in terms of whether it is uh, equalization levy or whether they will look at it, you know, from other countries where there are diverted profit tax. Um, those are the rules that, uh, you know, will come in in terms of, uh, uh, you know, determination of the PE itself, right? Um, and and what is being looked at is only a reallocation or a profit split beyond the ten percent, right? And yes. and if the profit is not and and they are they are looking at it you know from a from a different angle, uh, if if there is enough profit than ten percent, then the market jurisdiction should get uh, a share in that. But if it is less than ten percent, they will they will have traditional ways of uh, you know catching up with those uh, you know profits in terms of how it should be brought to tax. So are you trying so to So I don't think you are you are let off the hook because your your profit is less than ten percent. So are you trying to say for such company DST or L E L may continue? So it's it's a question of choice of uh, the countries, right? And if if, uh, if if a country like India chooses to remain with E L, and if if U K continues with their D P T regime. Uh, then, then I, I, I don't think it's a, um, uh, it's it's a, it's a mutually exclusive situation. So either you, so, sorry, can you please. So there is there is no clarity on that, but it, it's yes. a policy choice that the countries would make uh, once uh, uh, you know these things settle down. Uh, I have one really a big challenge. If the profit margin is supposed say fifteen percent, 
then the taxes to be paid in the market jurisdiction will be 1% of profit tax. Are you trying to say if the global companies are earning 50%, 1% will be allocated to market, say, let's say India, and out of that, the tax rate on that will come to 0.4 or whatever may be the tax rate, 0.4% tax rate. Is it a too low profit? I really wonder what amount of taxes the countries will garner like this thing. I'm baffled on this matter. Bala, to you. No, I, I, I agree with you. Um, uh, you know, the, the way, see, that's the problem with the formulary approach, right? Once you have a formulary approach and you don't have, you, you take out the linkage to the, uh, the function assets and the risks that are being performed. And that is what is today's, you know, transfer pricing uh, principles all about. Once you get into a formulary approach, you'll have to settle, uh, you know, for inefficiencies on either side. So, Rakesh, let me, let me, Sorry. yeah. Uh, let, let me, one question. Let me, you, yeah, please, please. Let me add on this point. I think uh, already the uh, issues have started surfacing, if you look right. at it. Uh, this week only, G24 have issued some state, uh, issued a joint statement uh, yes. saying that our concerns have not been fully addressed in the earlier statement and we would like the G20, G7 and OEC to consider. And one of the points is exactly the point that you're raising. They're saying it should not be 20%. The threshold should be 30% over there. And they also feel that the base level tax should also be a little higher. So already the confusion and the debate has started. And your point is very valid that 1% in your live example will not be sufficient in order to satisfy, I think, all the stakeholders, especially where larger consumers are based. Well, Vikas, I want to ask one more thing. This turnover limit of 20 billion euro is too huge, actually. We are working for 10 years on this project. And you can just take out all, only there will be 100, or just left with 100 companies, actually. You'll keep 90, all the companies out of the bracket, actually. And Your point is, what, yeah. What is the thought on this, Vikas? Is I think, too, uh, I think yes, another very relevant point, Rakesh, that uh, probably at this stage, uh, roughly about 100 odd con companies will get targeted or will get covered under this regime. I think two points on that. One, we should look at it more directionally, that this is the direction in which the international tax regime is heading towards to, which effectively means that even now or in near future, this 100 number could become 500 then eventually 5,000 and maybe 10,000, and there are already discussions going on. Second, even if you start with 500, this will probably be the first time in the global taxation regime that all countries have come together and said that, yes, let's allocate taxation rights amongst ourselves. Let's not fight with each other. To my mind, this is a very big achievement compared to the merely the number that we are talking about, Rakesh. I think very well said, very well taken. I think this is very well explained because thank you, this is a good thing. Anyway, I'm just going to pillar two. I have a battery of questions. I don't know how we'll push it with time. The purpose of GMT and the pillar two is to end tax competition between countries, or in other words, to stop the race to the bottom. That is, who could lower their corporate tax further and faster? No nations have ever won this race. So pillar two is propagating the minimum global tax rate with the propagating is 50%. This GMT would apply to the overseas profit. So government would still, still set whatever local taxes they want, but if companies pay lo lower taxes at a particular country, then the home country will top up the taxes to the minimum rate, eliminating the advantage of shifting a profit. So this is the main important activity today. And this GMT will be applied to companies who have a turnover of 750 billion euros and above. I'd like to back to you again now. Now we have a fireside chat questions coming up. Do you see the possibility of res resistance coming from countries where the corporate tax rate is less than 50% as the entire economic model will be shaken? What happens next? Con considering no. that the ch changes will be, have a, no, the 100 countries, they may say yes. Do you think these countries, uh, especially will not be met, they will have no say left actually, or they will have to fall in line? So, in my view, the later, right? You know, they will have to fall in line if, if uh, you know, they have to stay relevant in the world in terms of the world uh, trade. 
uh, and and if if large MNCs shy away from those countries which do not have which do not comply with this GMT, uh, you know, then 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 the country's economy will be at stake, and therefore, you know, over a period of time, the countries will start uh, falling in line. So. You know, I, I I don't I don't see any uh, any problem with uh, with with the countries uh, you know falling in line, right? Because the MLCs will have to uh, you know make their choices. But okay. what we'll also have to keep in mind is you know how they are going to get consensus amongst larger group, right? Because you know already people are talking about like what Vikas pointed out. Even here, you're going to have certain uh, uh, certain issues, and, and and even if you look at the rate at this level, what UK was pushing for was upwards of 19, 20 percent, right? Uh, in fact, they wanted a band. They wanted a range of uh, uh, you know minimum rate to be specified, but uh, you know somewhere you know they all settled at 15 percent because they wanted to arrive at a consensus uh, amongst themselves, right? And and therefore, if if uh, uh, you know if uh, things go to a larger group today, it is it is at G7, then it goes to G20, and 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 you know if if they have to take a buy-in from little more larger group, uh, probably the rate will start coming down. And I would say a 12 to 15 percent range is is what countries may settle uh, from a GMT perspective, which may be acceptable to many countries. Even Ireland's of the world will fall in line if it is going to be between 12 and 15. Right, 15 may be too high for certain countries, but if you make it a little more accessible at 12 to 15, uh, many countries may may accept it. Okay, that's wonderful. Because I uh, I have a question for you. Now, when you fix up a corporate tax rate, you know there's there's a lot of things you factor. You think about deductions. You think about special incentive. You think about the growth rate in the economy. You think about the per capita job population. So many factors. How do you believe the minimum Tax it in all the countries will be able to factor all in all into a common denominator, and then you come out with a definition which is acceptable to all the countries. How do you think it's going to be? It's going to be Herculean task to this it minimum will, tax. How do you factor this? It will be a difficult task, Rakesh. And I think your uh, answer in, it lies in the question itself that each country has its different tax jurisdictions, wherein they offer different incentives or tax reductions or other benefits in order to attract the investments and help kickstart the, uh, the companies in different parts of their own regions. Having said that, I think this factor has, uh, this issue has been taken into account. That's the reason uh, when they talk about the global minimal, minimal taxation of 15%, they have linked it to the effective tax rate. And when this we call, talk about the effective tax rate, that is to be built up on the accounting profits which are to be linked with the IFRS uh, accounting principles. So this issue has been taken into account. A simple formula has been prescribed over there to ensure that there are minimal anomalies between different countries when this computation mechanism is done. Having said that, it will not be an easy ask. So I come back to Bala again, very interesting challenges I see when I was going more into the depth of it in terms of implementation actually. If you see tax has two elements, essentially one, you have a tax base, and then you have a rate, a levy as a tax rate. Now, an agreement on the tax rate is getting in details, but get seriously complicated by different countries defining differently what constitutes taxable income or the tax base. So you have 130 country plus now. Is it is very challenging? And what is your opinion the tax base will be defined as? Since tax laws of each country vary in design and complexity, it may result in different income tax base and how the standard base of income will be defined. And I have one specific question here. With various accounting standards in place, GAAP, US GAAP, INDES, IFRS, and other local accounting regulations of each country, how do you see a challenge? How do you see a challenge in computing the global profit, applying the global rate? Would the enemies will be required to recalculate the profit on one standard applied to all the jurisdiction? Is it a Herculean task, no, I actually? Think, yeah, I think it will It will settle. Uh, I think there are already discussions to say that it will point to the gap which is practiced by the parent company, right? Um, and, uh, you know, more and more, uh, Rakesh ji, I would say that while we are getting a convergence on 
uh, tax principles as well, right, globally. I think this will also push the countries to, uh, you know, look for a convergence on accounting standards as well, right? And and that's another thing that we should we should look at because you know if if you are looking at you know uh, a, a globalized view of taxes, right, and a normalized view of taxes across the countries, uh, you should also have you know uh, the the a normalized standard of looking at you know what is what is financial reporting all about right and and therefore uh, you know adoption of ifrs uh, would become more and more prevalent and acceptance of ifrs would become more and more prevalent and that's something that these countries have to start the governments have to start looking at it and they have to reach a convergence on that otherwise as you pointed out there will be many confusions uh, and half of our discussions will go on what is the right base to look at and what is the yes. right, uh, uh, you know, rate to look at. Uh, so, A, while we look at the convergence on the taxes, we should also push for convergence on the tax rate uh, for, for the financial reporting as well. Number two, to okay. your point, uh, uh, you know, on 15%, I just want to, you know, probably throw it up as a discussion here as well and Vikas can come in. Uh, the, it is not a mandate to the countries to go to 15%, right? Because if, 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 you know, in a country where you do business and you derive income and you pay less than 15% tax, it gets thrown back to your, through your, you know, resident or the parent country, right? Yes. So therefore it is a disincentive for an MNC to go and go and operate in a country which has less than 15% because you may be thrown to a country uh, which is your parent country, which may be a much higher rate uh, in terms of uh, the headline rate. And then therefore, uh, you know, uh, um, therefore our effective tax rate may go up globally, right? And, okay. uh, and, and, and that is what is going to push the countries to come to a 15% rate and not by the mandate of, you know, the governments that they'll, they'll come to an agreement that they will come to 15%. It is by the flow of business and the stopping of business because the MNCs may not want to go and do business in a country which is less than 15%, which will prompt these governments to, to fall in line and come to 15% rate. And that's my view. Probably I'm, I'm open to... Uh, okay, you know, okay. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll come back to Bala on this. Because now, I've let's suppose a common leveler is GMT. Let's suppose for discussion of 50% is common to all. Let's say Ireland. Tax reduce tax reduce fifteen percent. Let's look at can these countries you see will provide a lot of non tax incentive and ease of doing business, forex laws, employment laws, any more incentives will be given so the business still remain there and don't shift back basically. So the revenue they continue to get there. So if I'm an island, I make the tax at fifteen percent, my tax rate goes up higher, and I continue to in invite you, give you intangible benefits to continue to do business there. So those countries are at gain. They are not at loss. First, they have increased the tax rate. And second, they have given more incentive for the company to stay back. Because what do you think? I have a radical thinking. I may be wrong. You can correct me. No, Rakesh, uh, uh, point well raised. I think a couple of things are likely to happen. One is uh, if and when the 15% tax rates come comes into play, I think it will change the way the international tax has been looked at by the global companies. What it will do is that it actually poses a lot of serious challenges for the so-called tax-friendly jurisdictions or other places where the tax rates have been particularly low, uh, including the Middle East, including the various uh, island nations where the tax rates have been very low over there. And there is no incentive left after this for those governments to keep it below 15 percent because the companies in any case will have to pay the additional tax as Bala pointed out in their home country jurisdiction. Okay. Now presuming that this tax rate comes into the range of 15 percent plus obviously the other incentives which are not the corporate tax incentive but it could be in the form of VAT it could be in, in the form of other benefits which you just spoke about ease of doing business compliances, etc. I think those factors will play an equally important role. And I think at this juncture, India stands at a position where it can take huge advantage of all these changes coming. And now or in the near future, I'm sure we are likely to benefit out of this. Yes, sir. 
was, was very good. So, uh, so one of the things which I find a very big challenge, how to determine the largest and the most profit multinationals, which will be a very key negotiable point. And uh, this definition is based on profitability threshold, and this has a lot of nuances. The businesses are complex, the balance sheets are complex. They are huge, actually. And I still think the 10% profit is extremely difficult until we come on a common denominator, denominator determining it. And the proposal based on very high threshold, I must tell you, all of us, my audience, may not be favorable for India, where presently tax are levied in the form of EL, or even the smaller companies on lower end ends up paying this thing. So what are your views, Bala, on this thing when this threshold India is not going to agree because they're collecting taxes on EL at a very low th threshold? And Indian government has already commented on this thing a couple of times. So what do you think India government respond will be like that on these threshold? Will they refuse it? Yeah, I'm not going to accept it. Or will do, they will reduce the threshold? No, no, I, I don't think, you know, they are going to, they are going to fight on a threshold at this point in time. I think no country is going to fight on threshold, right? Threshold is something that you can always change at a later point in time. I think they are going to, they are going to look at the, the ways of, uh, you know, defining profit base, ways of defining, you know, what is that, you know, threshold of 10%. What is the uh, what should be uh, you know the the super profit tax whether it should be twenty percent or thirty percent right uh, you know so those are the things that you know they are going to look at and what should be the GMT right twenty mil twenty billion dollars of threshold in pillar one or seven fifty million dollars I don't think any country is going to look at at this point in time because you know these are just entry points into into this particular regime and every country should be okay with it right. But having said that, India should, you know, I think this is this is something that we as chamber, we as industry should be, uh, you know, working with the government, right? India should look at whether it is beneficial with actual data points, right? You know, they should know what they will gain from pillar one because they are they are they are looking at pillar one now. They are not looking at pillar two at all, uh, and I'm I'm sure they should be looking at pillar two. Uh, what is what is that they are looking in pillar one? They are thinking that we are a large market jurisdiction with 1.3 billion population today. Uh, we will be say 1.6 in uh, you know three four years time frame. So it's a large market consumer uh, nation. So if there is an allocation of profit, we will we will stand to benefit out of it in the in the long run, right? And and that's what India is looking at, and rightly so. And India should look at it. They did not, you know, to your point on equalization levy, I don't think they got huge revenue from equalization levy. You know, we'll have to see what, you know, jump it is going to give them, you know, with the recent changes they made last year. But what, what they made, you know, a few years back, they didn't get uh, huge revenue. Probably 5,000, 6,000 crores of revenue is what they would have mocked up for on a equalization yeah. levy. So equalization levy is not a benchmark to look at what they will get on pillar one. So I'm sure they will. They would have had their numbers on pillar one, but on pillar two, we have to keep in mind we are a net exporter of service, right? And exports uh, uh, are about twenty percent of our GDP. Unlike you know other other countries like US, US has only ten percent of their exports uh, uh, you know contributing to G GDP, right? And our trade balance is also such that that our import and export is you know neck and neck at this point in time. So being a net exporter of service, uh, when you earn revenues outside of India and pillar two is going to make you pay more taxes outside India for some of the Indian MNCs, Indian government will have to give foreign tax credit. And, and yes. that is going to be a loss of revenue for the government. And they will have to look at how much of that loss is 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 uh, is on the table and whether that would you know work in 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 relation to the pillar one taxes that they will get and if, if those numbers speak in favor of india i don't think india is going to uh, oppose to any of these uh, proposals at this point in time that is thank you i just so basically for the impact of india india in fact just to summarize this discussion india has strongly advocated taxing large technology and digital service company that generate a large amount of their revenue in India because of the huge tax base. 
So the principles underlying the association clearly vindicates the stand for great care must get a greater share of profit for the markets and addresses the issue of cross border profit sharing and thus and thus consequential treaty shopping. So India stands gets vindicated when these policies within the threshold redefined, hopefully redefined, are reworked, and India position gets recognized acceptable before the world. And India has always been a champion to the biggest cause forward for collecting taxes at the WP20 level. Now, uh, uh, one question again, I come back to Bala. Says India corporate tax rate is above the proposed GMT rate of 15%, say for non manufacturing company. It is expected that India ETR may also be above this rate. So, my question to my both the colleagues are will it impact global collection of the tax? Does it, will it impact these companies? Will it bring more taxes to the government of India? Yeah, I, I can take it. Uh, it uh, you know. So, as I said, uh, uh, you know, Rakesh ji, I think it, it's a question of mathematics that the Indian government will have to look at what they will get from pillar one and what they will lose in pillar two. Right? In my humble view, they will lose in pillar two, they will gain in pillar one. And if they gain much more in pillar one, I think this integrated proposal would work, right? Uh, so then they will have to look at how to incentivize the exports, uh, uh, you know, because as I said, 20% of our GDP comes from exports today, right? And and that's a lifeline of, uh, uh, you know, much of our tax revenues as well, because, uh, you know, we don't tax a major portion of our GDP, right? You know, agriculture is not in the tax net. So when you can't expand your tax net, due to certain political and social conditions that India is, you will have when and when your economy is reliant on exports, your policies will also have to be, you know, juxtaposed in the manner that it will promote exports, right? And, and if these proposals are going to hurt exports because, uh, you know, we'll pay taxes outside India and they will have, India will have to get, get credit, India will have to give credit back in India, then they are going to be you know, it, 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 it's a very costly affair for India to promote exports, right? Because India will shy away from, uh, uh, you know, facilitating companies to do business outside India because for every dollar that I bring back, India is going to cough up a foreign tax credit, right? Instead of earning an income, they're going to get a foreign tax credit, right? And that is the cost of promoting exports, which the government will have to look at. Uh, whether they want to facilitate exports at the cost uh, rather than at a benefit is, is something that, uh, you know, the government will have to look at it. Yeah. I'll Rakesh, come back to Bala in one more. Yeah, sorry. Yes, Vikas, I was coming yeah, to you. Rakesh, just to supplement what Bala said, I think a couple of points merit attention on this point. Yeah. But immediately, we may not see the numbers coming in. But what will gradually happen is the global companies will have to relook at their entire business models including supply chain, including where they house their IP rights. Because these are two major contentious issues right now. They will have no incentive to park their rights in those jurisdictions where they have been doing it merely because of the tax advantage. That is one point to bear in mind. So they will be restructuring and reorganization which will happen in near future. India likely to gain out of that. Second, India has already voiced its concern in the this week's paper, when it uh, signed up with the G24, it has already said that uh, there should be a coordination between the new rules and the digital services tax and Indian contract equalization levy, which effectively means that we we have we are already saying that we do not want to give up equalization levy rights immediately. We want to see what will be the impact, and then maybe we will do it gradually. And that, if you read the fine print very carefully, I think this thought process is emerging that we should do it gradually over a period of time. Third, I think it is likely that equalization levy, along with the significant economic presence, continues in sub shape and form, because if we look at government started collecting revenues, and Bala pointed out about the figures, when we started, we collected about 300 crores in 16-17, and last year we collected about 2,000 crores. It is gradually going up. And if we exclude only few top companies from this, I think we'll lose a lot of revenue vis-a-vis -vis the other companies. So I think it'll be a gradual shift over a period of time in a phased manner. 
Okay. So, Bala, you mentioned that take a scenario. If suppose Ireland raise the taxes to 17%, that the entire tax will be subject to tax credit in India, or the taxes will go to Ireland. And in my opinion, in this way, Indian government will lose the taxes as they will not get any taxes under Pillar 2. Is this understanding correct? And does the business nature of business, B2B or B2C, makes a difference? No, no. Uh, I, I think B2B uh, is where, uh, you know, Pillar 2 would mostly, uh, you know, um, uh, apply. Uh, and B two C is where you know we look at a larger shift of profits with this um, B two C, right? And when you look at B two B, I think what Vikas pointed out: first, there will be a weeding out of those countries which are artificial today, right? So if 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 a company is operating with an artificial structure in a, in a country like Ireland, you know it it will it will it will just unwind over a period of time, right? But if you have a real business, and if you have a real business in Ireland, say for instance, the, the example that you took of Ireland, if you have a real business and you continue to operate it, operate in it despite, uh, you know, whatever be the tax rate, right? And Ireland chooses to increase the rate to 17%. You're right, India will have to give so much credit back, right? And, and, and in a manner, it is a zero-sum game as far as the MNC is concerned, because what I have paid in Ireland, I'm, I'm going to claim as credit back in India, uh, but India is going to lose. And that's the point that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm taking pains to uh, you know, explain, that in Pillar 2, there will be some credit that needs to be given by the home country, which is, you know, and, and in, 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 in India circumstance, we are a net exporter, our reliance on exports is, is very high. Uh, exports will come at a cost of shelling out tax instead of earning tax. And that's that's the that's the problem which is going to happen. Okay. Vikas, uh, now I will rush a little bit to have uh, some uh, fireside questions coming from my side. These proposals which are being developed are likely to bring a significant change in the overall international tax architecture under which multinational business is currently operate. How do you think this will be done? You see MLI, MLI 2 coming at one possible way of facilitating the tax duty changes so as to avoid the ordeal of amending each duty in this regard. What do you think how this all changes will bring in the complete tax architecture of the world? What do you think with us on this? I think that case, similar to the experience we had uh, in the recent past, there is likely to be a, some international arrangement, call it MLI or otherwise in which uh, certain issues will get addressed, whether it is on the globe MLI or the uh, uh, or the amount A MLI. I think all these things will get merged in some form, shape or the other, and there will be a global consensus based. Otherwise, renegotiating treaties uh, will be very difficult. So two changes Impossible. likely to happen. One, domestic law changes, which countries will have to go through. For example, in the Indian context, we are talking about equalization levy. And second will be a global arrangement in the form of an MLI, which companies will come forward. And once the broad consensus is built and there is a meeting of the minds likely to happen over, over the next couple of months, I think we should be able to have an international arrangement on that. So Bala, I will ask you one question, whether you agree with me or disagree with me. Do you think this international tax is likely to get complicated, complicated as there will eventually be an interplay between three treaties? To see which applies to the company. There's a bilateral treaty between the two nations. There's already MLI in force as a covered agreement. And now you will have a new treaty for global minimum tax and digital taxation. Then we interplay of this. Will this get complicated? Is my thinking right? Is become quagmire of going sunk into the whole laws, treaties, which applies, which doesn't apply? Turning of pages, I'll you, you know, three. I'll give you a safe exit. Go set up business in Mars or in space. <laughs> I thought, Bala, you are going to ask Rakesh a counter question. Are you happy with these changes as a tax professional or not? Because it is going to increase your business multifold. I'm, I'm still in industry, like, because, so you know, I, I need to I need to find ways of uh, you know coming out of all of this. I agree. So I must tell you one thing. I'm most happy when my when my people around the business grows. I want to make I want to earn out of that. That gives me more happiness. Anyway, coming to one interesting thing. Both the panels. Both the panels. Do you see the end of BEPS project? Do you believe or do you think all action 15 stands addressed? Do you believe will this BEPS to coming to end? Will this be a global panacea 
for all tax evasion, low taxation, double non-taxation. All you believe is still in a utopia. I bundle all these questions. Both the panelists I want to hear. Starting with Vikas, can you Vikas your thought? So Rakesh, first of all, I learned that if it is simple, it can't be a tax law, and if it is a tax law, it can't be simple. And when you have more than 100 countries coming together, it's bound to add to the complexity. Having said that, let's yeah. look at it more positively, uh, both from uh, India's perspective as a global perspective. This is the first time we are saying uh, that there are challenges in the way the international tax regimes have worked. Okay, And there is a broad consensus that let's review the international tax structures and arrive at consensus to have minimum taxation across the globe. And second, there is a consensus which is built, being built up and India has been contending on this for the last 10 years plus that we should get certain rights and we, when I say India it means similar countries which have large consumer base because the earlier models which are built on the physical presence or the permanent establishment are no more good. So I think let's look at it more positively even though it will add to complexity. Having said that Taxation is not an exact science. I think if we arrive at a consensus with simplified formulas in terms of determination of income and computation of taxes, barring some gain and some loss here and there, I think it can work wonderfully well. Having said that, I think the, there is already a provision uh, which is being proposed that there are bound to be certain disputes and there should be some dispute resolution mechanism there as well. But I think we should approach it more positively. Mala, I would hear you. Do you believe the BEPS in the end of the BEPS project, do you believe all action 15 all the stands address with uh, pillar one and two coming when they come to end? Is it a global panacea for tax evasion? No, I, I, I don't think there can be an end to this, uh, Rakeshji, because uh, you know when we started this, uh, we couldn't we couldn't visualize what is digital, and digital was way way different. Uh, you know when we started this project, right? Uh, and now even when we are grappling with the right model to 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 tax this i think the model is going to evolve and change right and and you know if you look at by the time we we come to a conclusion on this uh, the digital could be something else and what was yeah. digital then what is digital now and what is digital tomorrow is going to constantly evolve and therefore the tax consensus will also have to evolve right uh, and I don't think it is going to be end of it. And I, 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 I think in the interest of the countries also, uh, they should not put an end to it because then it will, it will put the MNCs into an uncertainty as to, uh, as to, uh, you know, dealing with a law which is outdated. Uh, and without, uh, you know, uh, you know, at least if it is a sovereign law, you can go to the government and, uh, you know, make a representation. But, but if it is, you know, in, in a group like this. They should not disband it. It should be there, and they should constantly look at it. An organization like OECD is something which which has which has evolved over a period of time. It has, uh, you know, remained for the you know the times to come, and then therefore this project should also continue in the interest of both the government and the businesses. I think and I I try to Vikas's point. You know, whatever be the conclusion, I think simplicity and certainty are two important aspects in any tax policy, and that's what businesses look for, right? I because need, we are I need here to add business, Please. And, and, uh, um, and, and if it's a certain and a simple, uh, you know, uh, a law to uh, look at and uh, comply with, we will, we will all, uh, you know, welcome it. I think I take a stand, believe, basically, the business will become more intricate, business you rightly mentioned become more digitalized. There'll be a paradigm shift taking place basically and human mind and brain will work in more way to see how they can mitigate the liability so this cannot and will not will be the global, global panacea for all tax revisions you'll see different challenges new challenges with the intricacy and the complexity of the business which we see are likely to come in future because briefly can you share some global perspective on this how are other companies or countries voicing on this which country is reducing the minimum tax to 50%? Do you believe there may not be a kind of tax that will go in the jurisdiction and be comprehended? What do you think about the other countries talking about on this? I think, Rakesh, globally, the countries are looking at it from their own perspectives right now, uh, even though broadly the consensus has been built up. 
and this issue as we speak is being discussed at the highest levels uh, at the government let me give you certain examples uh, there was a recent uh, us uh, tax administration report called made in america tax plan which points out certain clearing examples of why the us is going ahead and recommending the changes and pushing for it of the top 10 uh locations for us multinational profits in 2018 seven were in tax friendly jurisdictions more us profits are housed in some of the tiny islands than combined us global profits of the multinationals in major economies which include china india japan france canada and germany combined another striking example which was pointed out in that report was bermuda country of 64000 people has houses 10% of the overall reported us mnc profits which is many times more than its own gdp so if these things are being brought to the light i think there are changes bound to happen now look at the recent issues on the uk and us side as well on the digital services tax look at the recent issues in terms of the australia also now what is happening ireland initially opposed but now they are they are trying to build up a consensus because they think they will have to toe the line sooner or later similarly other other jurisdictions also are voicing concerns bermuda has voices concerns gcc is also gcc countries are also being brought on table in order to build up a consensus because otherwise these countries are bound to lose so i think there will be some back and forth rakesh as we go along there will be more consensus building and political maneuvering but largely we are moving in that direction right now okay i'll come to the almost conclusion the final question basically the scp is an indian domestic law and to tax company having users and revenue over the threshold and pillar one which was the non treaty and pillar one will apply under the respective tax treaties does the i believe the entire ecosystem of treaty and non treaty country at least in india gets covered and tax under pillar one i think the smartest move by the indian government they plug all the loopholes of the leakages treaty countries non treaty country and maybe make it difficult for people to avoid or evade or not pay less taxes as we go forward before we end up just let me give you a conclusion basically friends it would be interesting to watch how these two pillar recommendation if finalized would be implemented because it is proposed that there will be a multilateral instrument signed for pillar 1 and some of the recommendation pillar to have to be implemented via bilateral treaties what happens if you don't have bilateral treaties There's still final details to be worked out. The computation of covered income is proposed to be based on financial profit, which we just talked and mentioned, which may I believe will be a humongous task for to ask every business to move into IFRS worldwide. I think it will be a really Herculean task to move that. A question may arise: Will these standards, like IFRS, become mandatory also? I think time will tell. Future, unless not all the countries comes on board. OECD G20 framework. There may still be chances that MNE would take shelter under some favorable countries and may go untaxed because of the nature of the business that's going to evolve. In my opinion, or it is going to become impossible for such countries to remain under tax or non-tax. Time will tell. Alternative, if if they do nothing, these countries may effectively lose out on tax rights and face pressure by profit limited locally. Could be taxed in other country. So, friends, basically, in nutshell, the broad framework that challenge that changes the rules of international globally have actually been received in Trialism from last two three years. We have been talking about below and below too. It seems that this will come out with some solution. Will tax revenue address the things that we need to get taxes paid where businesses work without the rules? Business are done without the rules. However, it's not. Get a done deal, and many gray areas are still to be addressed. One final point: I really wonder, actually, to see how importance is being given worldwide. We have G5, we have G20, we have G24. We have an inclusive framework. See how much the government or the countries are giving to it. I don't know the reason. I'm sure they are trying to come out with the best solution. And as close as yesterday, what we talked today, by that time we were ready with all the notes. G24 yesterday submitted the comments exactly what we discussed today, and we have been and what were in our mind actually. I found G20 basically 
uh, I, work, I have stated in the same direction, the demands are truly inclusive process where concerns of the developing countries and the potential unintended consequence of the rules are adequately addressed. We mentioned about this thing. It strongly suggests reallocation percent should not be less than 30% 30, 30 of the MNE, not to deep profit going to a limited number of companies. We discussed that basically. And G24 is of the view that the proposed appropriate coordination between the new international tax rules and the removal of DFP not be done at once. I think somebody mentioned here, I think because of Allah mentioned it, rather it should be gradual. Last statement by both of my colleagues. Any one in the one minute. Bala, to you. Last statement. Bala. Uh, you know, I think these are interesting times, Rakesh ji. You know, and uh, I would not uh, lay too, too much stress on what the government should do uh, in terms of these negotiations. I think you know they all know you know what to do best for the country. But as businesses, all that I can hope for is a simple and a and a and a, uh, and a certain tax regime, and uh, which is you know which is applied globally and which is applied normally in you know in every country that we do business in. Um, if 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 we if these things achieve that objective, I think we will have uh, we will have a lot of uh, ease in doing business, uh, and we would achieve the prime minister's vision on Vasuteva Kurumbakam. Right and uh, you know and even in tax law, uh, and then that, that would be a, a very long term uh, goal on this, and uh, we would uh, look forward to that. Vikas, last statement, one minute, please. Yeah, I think these are all, these all limits are or the thresholds are directional, because they are likely to be reviewed and undergo changes as we go along. Yes. There will be an interplay of domestic tax laws and international laws, and I think businesses will have to adjust and accommodate accordingly. Some members issued um, so now. Yes. I think we lost. Uh, okay. Yeah, Avinash, go ahead. So now we come to this end of this session. And uh, on behalf of SHM, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to Shri Rakesh Nandia, Shri Vikas Vasan, Shri K. Pala Subramanian for sharing their important views on this very important session. And uh, Thank you very much, sir. I, uh, now we'll move to this next session, which is on tax aspect on, of ESG. And for this session, I would like to welcome uh, the session moderator, Neha Malhotra. Sorry, because I missed yes. the last statement. Sir, yes, sir. Can Rakesh, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Can you hear me, because Yes, yes. yes Rakesh, sir. we thought you have already gone to space. <laughs> Hello, Vikas, can you hear me? Yeah, Rakesh, we I can can't hear you. you. Sir, we, we can, can hear, you. hear you. I'm sorry, sir. Rakesh, we can hear you, but I think you can't hear us. Vikas, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Rakesh, yeah, we can hear you. I'm sorry, sorry. I might have yeah. some problem. We can hear you, but I think you were not able to hear you, uh, yes. hear you but we just concluded, and Avinash is uh, now starting with the second panel. Yes, thank you, everyone. Sorry, I, my computer gave away battery. I didn't realize it. No, thanks, second. Rakesh, for moderating the lively session. Thank you, Bala. Thank you, because I think it is with something interesting, new thoughts, new processes. I think the discussion will go on. Before we end it up with Avinash, the change is likely to come in the month of October. We have a second session of international conference. We have a session in November, and we will try to plug in any new changes that have come, which are meaningful. We'll be like to share it with the audience after seeing those changes that's likely to come in the month of October. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. It was wonderful having everyone here on the conference. Thank you. I mean, Ash, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So now I would like to invite our. Uh, Session moderator, Ms. Neha Malhotra, welcome to you, Director of Nanga Industry Private Limited. And I would also like to welcome other panelists for this session. Uh, Mr. Rahul Garg, Chairman, National Council on Direct Tax, SOCM. 
Mr. Ajay Agrawal, Global Head of Tax Vedanta, and Mr. Amit Mishra, Head of Direct Taxation GMR Group. So over to you, Nia, uh, to take this thing forward in this session. Thank you, Avinash, and uh, good evening, everyone. It is uh, a privilege to be a part of this panel discussion, and uh, I thank SOCHAM for giving us this opportunity to discuss this important issue, ESG, and to analyze the tax aspects that come out of this uh, this hot topic, I can say, of ESG, which is entering every boardroom, every uh, board discussion, that how ESG will play, play an important role in the uh, businesses. So I have with me Rahul, Ajay, and Amit, and all of us will try and throw light and discuss certain important aspects of ESG and how it impacts businesses, how companies are uh, becoming aware of the uh, or becoming uh, diligent as to how they have to respond to this ESG framework. So ESG, it, this whole thing started 16 years ago, a group comprised of financial institutions, global consultants, government bodies, regulators, and research analysts came together to examine what role environmental, social, and governance factors play in long-term investments. That meeting led to a report endorsed by the United Nations, stating it was in fact important for businesses to consider how to integrate ESG value drivers into financial market research analysis and investments. So cutting it short, ESG became commonly used as a generic term by investors, regulators, and activists to evaluate corporate behaviors and hint at companies' future financial performance. Europe has led the charge. Even India has now mandated BRSR report for the top 1,000 companies by their market value. And there is some expectation that some ESG standards may come into play in US too. So it's all warming up and the regulations are becoming stringent from ESG. Business performance that was formerly linked to profit and returns only is now also taking cognizance of the potential environmental and social impact the business creates. ESG are matters associated with corporate responsibilities and sustainability material to long-term enterprise value creation. Much of the focus among ESG proponents has been on environmental factors and rightfully so. Now, however, there has been an increased focus on social factors as many consumers emphasize social and ethical integrity as a determining factor for which company products and services they purchase and support. So they are trying to answer with the help of their wallets that they want to connect with a company which is ESG conscious. How tax became a part of it is what, I, what we're going to discuss today. So taxation be, is being placed more and more in the context of companies, corporate strategy and sustainability objectives. The world has witnessed a drive to create greater tax transparency with more rules being formulated to curb tax avoidance agendas. As the previous session, we saw GMT, that is the global minimum tax, is another way of OECD trying to tell that you companies are responsible to take a, take a global minimum tax to for because tax is what is going to help the company countries contribute to the society or to improve the lives of communities. The government too has highlighted tax as a moral obligation of our time. And after all, Tax selection is ultimately invested in the public facilities like hospitals, schools, infrastructure, and in, to improve lives of communities and nations. The pandemic has amplified the importance of tax contribution from corporates for economic rebuilding. So now over to you, Ajay. Tax is becoming one of many factors which an investment committee considers when assessing the return on investment. Investors are also influencing companies to adopt tax risk management and governance frameworks, adopting sustainable tax principles, either as a part of a broader entity wide ESG program or as a standalone effort is a significant, significant task that requires commitment from the board and senior management like you. How are companies practically adapting to the change? How are ESG principles being embedded in companies tax structure? What are the boardroom considerations for taking tax, taking a tax position? Thank you, Neha, and uh, many thanks to SHM for uh, holding this event. Clearly, you know, ESG is becoming uh, sort of a bread and butter on everybody's uh, agenda. Everybody is talking about uh, ESG today. Uh, perhaps 
few years back, us would not have bought the ESGs to do with tax. And today, uh, leading the tax function of one of the largest, uh, you know, conglomerate in India, I can tell you, I don't spend any meeting or I don't do any meeting where ESG is not been discussed. Uh, clearly, you know, taxes is, is, is today one of the component of ESG, but all business decision, whether it is financially viable or not, everything has been uh, measured how investor community, stakeholder, uh, outside community, within the organization, our vendors, our government is going to view any decision from the lenses of ESG. So therefore, to my mind, ESG is becoming an extremely important and critical aspect of doing business in India and rather globally, I would say. We follow up, you know, very clear principle, Neha, in terms of uh, zero harm and zero discharge. So that's our stated agenda, and that has been, you know, our DNA for many, many years uh, so far. Clearly, business is paramount, but to do business in a sustainable manner, the manner in which people will appreciate entrepreneurs' behavior has been the DNA of the organization. Therefore, nothing we do which leaves the issue of ESG onto the table not being addressed. Clearly, tax is also always considered as part and parcel of decision making, whether or not you know, ESG is leveled around uh, the business decision. Let me you know, give you two, three examples of how we have addressed ESG issue in terms of taxation. Uh, we publish you know, tax transparency report. Um, it is not mandated uh, under the Indian uh, law that one has to produce the tax transparency report. But we felt that, you know, otherwise, how are we going to communicate to a larger stakeholders in terms of what is our tax principle and tax philosophy? Second, we do, we all know that, you know, each of the organization have uh, mandatorily need to spend some money because of CSR. Uh, also, we know for the fact that, you know, CSR is not a deductible tax expenditure, but, you know, from an environmental perspective, from a societal perspective, we felt it is onerous for organizations like us to spend disproportionate amount towards social well-being, for the well-being of the organization, for its people, for its vendor and the larger community. We run a, a significant program in the country called Nandaghar. You know, the focus and purpose of that initiative is to provide livelihood to women and children. So various aspects have been considered when we do business in India. Some have some tax impact, some have some tax advantage to it, and many of it are not necessarily measured whether we are going to get any kind of benefit from a taxation point of view. Neha? Yeah. So over to you, Amit, now that the since we all see that the spotlight is now on tax and that has resulted in increased reputational risk requiring improved understanding, governance and oversight of tax matters at senior level. Has GMR group formulated a tax governance strategy that gives the corporations necessary transparency? So what is your corporate uh, view on transparency? The way Vedanta has been doing it uh, voluntarily though there is no mandate to do it, but they're still doing it uh, consciously. So what's GMR's view on that? Thank you. Thank you, Neha. And uh, uh, thanks to SOHM for organizing this event and inviting me in the panel. And uh, I would second the view of Ajay, which he has said that uh, ESG, uh, you know, has become a very important and critical parameter, uh, which today determines your access to finance capital or human capital or even the perception of the public. So it is become increasingly important for all the corporate, uh, be it in India or globally. Now coming to your point on uh, GMR. Uh, so in GMR, uh, we believe that uh, our responsibility towards environment, society, and as well as governance 
is not a destination. It's a journey which we all have to make. It's a continuous effort which we have to make to improve our contribution towards all these three. And we have been doing it uh, for so many years. Before the word ESG uh, might have come into picture, but all the responsible corporates of the country are doing these things. So if I give you an example, uh, you know, from the environment perspective, so as you are aware, we are running a few of the major airports in India. And uh, one of them is uh, IGI, that uh, T3 in Delhi terminal. And this terminal, uh, you know, uh, when it is started, it got the gold accredited lead awards, which is the leader in environment uh, award, which is given by the US authorities. And that was the first of in kind in the world. Mm -hmm. In the in the green category, right. so same way, same way, you know, in the Hyderabad uh, airport, uh, we have 650 more than 650 acres of landscape of green parks, which is a natural sink of the carbon emission. Mm. And uh, likewise, you know, in all the airports we are today running, uh, we have a zero tolerance policy for single use plastic use. So that way, that way. What I said, it's it's not a there cannot be a scorecard for ESG. It's a continuous process which you have to uh, make uh, continuous efforts to give back to the society in terms of environment, society, and tax and governance. Same way, in terms of society, we have our uh, Varalashmi Foundation, uh, which is engaged in various social activities and other things for the uh, society. And uh, coming to the taxes part, we always believe uh, in paying the right taxes, mm -hmm. the government. And uh, that is embedded in our DNA, I would say. So for the past many years, uh, we have been doing it. We are transparent in our uh, tax dealing with the tax department. We are taking all the decision in consultation uh, with the experts in consultation with our auditors, in consultation with the audit committee. So that way we are totally transparent. And, uh, you know, the one thing I would like to mention here that, uh, you know, uh, taxes historically been a private matter between the taxpayer and the tax department. And, and uh, the, the duty of the taxpayer is to self assess themselves. And the duty of the tax department is to scrutiny, do the scrutiny assessment. But as as you said, rightly said that you know uh, it is now becoming a matter of the boardroom that exactly. uh, what type of transparency we should bring in the tax function so that you know we are we are complied with this uh, ESG requirement. So we currently uh, in GMR we are evaluating. At, at present, there is no mandate by the law. Right. to give any kind of uh, transparency so far as the taxes are concerned, but definitely we are evaluating that and uh, we'll come up with something like that. So your journey for tax transparency is already in place. It's just that the report is not yes. yet out. Just that. Yes. Right. So I think this is a story with most of the companies because companies are well aware of their duty towards being tax transparent towards the public that tax is a matter that public has a right to know whether a company is appropriately paying taxes, what are their tax governance policies. So uh, let me ask Rahul here. Is this shifting global environment? It is important that uh, tax is viewed not only as a critical compliance function, but as a valuable strategic organizational asset. Challenges to tax strategy are becoming more evident with global pressure for trans transparency. Organizations need to develop a clear strategy for tax that is delivered effectively and aligned with business goals. What is your advice to the corporates regarding tax strategy? Do you think uh, tax can be a value driver? I think it's a it's a no brainer today. So as mm -hmm. I just said that if your investors are looking at it, if your customers are looking at it, if your exactly. vendors are looking at it, then if it is in their reckoning a testing criteria for you, mm -hmm. then this becomes automatically a key driver. Right. Now, when you say a key driver, and I want to call it out here, typically a tax function in an organization was in past rewarded 
for paying minimum taxes within law. And if you look at the KPIs of the any tax manager or a tax director, their KPI was that how can we pay minimum tax remaining within the framework of law. Today, if we see that the excess has moved already, not from paying minimum tax or right tax or taxes per law to fair taxes, then the whole orientation of the organizations changes. And it's not just for goodness that has suddenly come on to the businesses as lessons of life. There is a lot of meat in this from a financial perspective that is leading to this change of heart in the businesses. And what is, I just want to illustrate that, how important is that strategic driver? Earlier we used to say that if you save $100, and if your PE multiple is 20, what, what do you add to your valuation? 20 multiplied by 100. And today, if by paying that $100 tax, you improve your ESG score from 20 to 21, then that additional valuation multiple applies to your million dollar of profit and not on $100 of taxes. And therefore, how it impacts your valuations is far, far different than looking at the tax of $100 being saved. So I would think that the proposition that you raise, whether it should be regarded as a value driver, the answer today is it has always been regarded as a value driver, but now the way it is to be counted as value driver and the underlying matrices for that have significantly changed and we need to have the reorientation of the businesses as Ajay mentioned in everything besides the financials outcome you also look at what would the tax contribute and that contribution is not a change of heart that contribution has meaning in the business right rightly pointed Rahul it is actually already a value driver and companies should look at it like a value driver so asking you Ajay here that uh, tax declarations continue to be a focus for governments and international regulators, stakeholders alike, in, including investors, employees and customers. They will continue to ask for more transparency in how business operates. Many countries have already reached political agreement on public CBCR directive, whereby companies above a prescribed threshold will be required to disclose their income tax payments or annual progress report on the implementation of their tax strategy. This whole enhanced government action on tax reporting is likely at some point, maybe sooner than later, this will be a significant factor for MNEs as they will have to consider compliance with new disclosure rules and provide supplementary tax information. Although it is a step in the right direction, is it asking for too much? Will this add to the overall compliance burden? Though you, your company is already uh, issuing a tax transparency report, but is this whole thing going to add to the compliance burden? Well, uh, a fresh report uh, from Matt comes and. Well, I think, you know, uh, from Vedanta's perspective, I can tell you that we are, we are very well prepared to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, provide any kind of disclosure in whatever manner and fashion the government seeks to obtain it. From Vedanta, and I'm 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 equally confident that the industry is prepared to do what is right. Now, right. you know, uh, if I look at if we did not had let's say something called tax transparency report, how would I communicate with my larger stakeholders? Mm. Additionally, if you look at the financial statement, there are only two three uh, baskets where you would find some tax disclosures are being mentioned either in your P&L account that this is your current tax or you know mm. somewhere in the balance sheet that this is the advanced tax or, or this is the you know tax which is to be received from the government and lastly somewhere in the contingent liability statement where you would say that you know these are the cases which are pending right. i thought that this is a great medium to communicate 
mm. uh, tracks transparency report, communicate to variety of stakeholders. You know, uh, let's take a couple of examples, your customers. You can today go and tell your customer that this is my tax guiding principle. This is my strategy. This is how I do business keeping tax in mind. Uh, look at from the government perspective today when I go and meet any tax officer. First thing I go and say that, you know, thanks for leaving tax on us. And this is my contribution to the exchequer. And this is the report which is summarized in a manner which is reader friendly. You can look at the document and you can tell me that. Yes, this is my contribution has been to the nation building. Uh, right. You spoke of, you know, uh, stakeholder activism. This is right. a very, very interesting area. People are checking. People are talking about how are we doing on our tax strategy? How do I communicate? Can I speak to each of the investors on a on a one to one basis? Possibly no. I mean, right. this is a document, uh, you know, already available in a public domain. You can go through if you have any questions, you can ask vendors. Mm -hmm. They can challenge us. Are we paying on time? Are we depositing their, you know, TDS on time? What has yes, been our strategy on uh, GST? And look at from your, uh, you know, broader clients perspective. Who is our customer? How and we operate not only in India across the globe. So if we are transparent, if we are doing business with our clients, clients would be more interested to know what has our tax policy, and they perhaps would like to work with the, you know, customer or a vendor who follows a, you know, uh, apparently transparent tax policy. They would exactly. love to work with them. So this is another uh, strategy to you know acquire market share or to get you know, better score in terms of your vendor visibility. So, I mean, it, it, I can't really, you know, bucket that. Okay, because if I do tax transparency report, or if I do this kind of discussion with the government, this is what the outcome would be. Right. Some outcome can be measured. Some outcome cannot be measured, but all in all, there is nothing to lose. It's everything to gain. If we follow uh, a path, which is towards robust disclosure on all matters, including tax. And I think it would be welcome by the government. Yeah, I think in all this, I can easily say that government will be able to follow the non adversarial approach. If they see that the taxpayers are so open and so coming out in transparency that they are open about their tax strategy, their tax policies and their tax payments to the government. I think the, the whole taxpayer charter, which we thought is, is a, is a ideal document will be followed. And what is your view on this same question? I mean, I'll just repeat the question again for your uh, benefit that this whole uh, compliance, the additional compliance that is that we can see is going to happen sooner or uh, later, ra sooner rather than later. Is this asking for too much? Are your company is your company prepared to, uh, for this or do you think it will be a compliance burden to a certain extent? So far as uh, you know, compliance is concerned, uh, and so far as GMR is concerned, uh, we are totally prepared. Whatever uh, disclosure requirements, uh, whether it is currently required or in future, even if government brings. So, right. in, in terms of uh, disclosures, we are totally prepared. There is uh, no issues as such. And the only thing is that I think uh, you know, uh, government should come up with clear cut guidelines. Right. as to what should be the disclosures otherwise what will happen if everyone start uh, you know voluntarily disclosing their uh, you know uh, tax strategies uh, tax payments and all uh, for investors or any other outsider any stakeholder it will be difficult to make an apple to apple comparison of the disclosures right it, so my my view is that that uh, you know uh, before anything uh, a corporate uh, starts it's better that government should come up with a clear cut parameters on which some disclosures should happen should happen Another point uh, which i have neha is that you know today government uh, has all the information so mm -hmm. much data and information government is having is that they can clearly make out you know what are your contribution to exchequer what are your tax policies what are your tax strategies I have seen, uh, you know, uh, in Hyderabad or in any other cities also, 
the tax department in informal gatherings they they you know they recognize the highest taxpayer of the of the city or highest taxpayer of the region or something like that so i mm. i think that government should do something like that that if they have all the data they should give some certificate okay this this corporate is has complied has totally complied mm. with the tax law and paid the tax correct taxes or pay mm. taxes mm -hmm. Yeah, favorable that, tax order is what your reward <laughs> yeah, is right yeah. now. <laughs> but but from a, we are totally ready from any type of disclosure. Only thing is that if if there is some some guidelines, some parameters from the government, that would be helpful. Right. So your views on Rahul now that this whole corporate disclosure may help the may help curb the incidence of aggressive tax planning that can create corporate governance risk. Lead to material fines, damage corporate and brand reputation, and deprive government of the funding needed to provide services to the community. However, enhanced corporate income tax disclosures could itself lead to change in tax laws, perhaps as a result of government gaining insight into tax practices and public uh, reaction to ESG disclosures. What are your views on this? I would say two things, and uh, there was a very white shade of conversation that Ajay made that the disclosure being made for taxes, whether of the tax strategy, whether of the total tax contribution that an organization makes, whether of the comparison with the peer group, the point that Amit made that the government has so much of data and they recognize highest taxpayer, next highest taxpayer, and what are they doing? All these three aspects are one, a compliance burden to you if you view it in that manner. Mm. And second, the point that Ajay made, that's an opportunity for you to take a competitive advantage. That's an mm. opportunity for you to take your narrative in a manner which is not left to anybody's imagination. Exactly. So just imagine the point that Amit made. If the government has taxes from all companies and if they publish a report, that FMCG companies have the taxes in India. And if you find this is given by company, a long list of companies and somebody pays 5% tax, somebody pays 15% and somebody pays 29%. If that report is published, then what would happen? Mm. Immediately, the activist and analyst would start looking at it. They would ask the company which is paying 25% taxes, why are you paying 25% taxes? And they would ask the company which is paying 5% tax, why are you paying 5% taxes? Exactly. So both would be asked the question. And the expected answer from both would be something that satisfied the just explanation of that. Now that is an area which is very imminent. That's a, that's a situation and a scenario which is very imminent. And how do you control that situation? And as I just said, if you already have your tax strategy, tax policy, how do you make the decision on tax? What's your attitude towards tax planning? There are 10 elements of the tax strategy document. If you already have that out in public domain, people would know I would not avail of a tax incentive unless I find that tax incentive was actually meant for my kind of a business, even if there is a legal loophole for me to avail that. Now, that's an opportunity for you. So I would think that here is an opportunity where some businesses may choose to avail of that, despite the fact there isn't a statutory requirement for it, and some may wait for a statutory requirement to come in before following it. But in any case, whether it is government, whether these are analysts or whether these are activists, you would have much more comparable information available in public domain. And as you said, public CBCR, we fought to the nail when CBCR was being submitted to Indian tax department that it has confidential information and it should be left lock and key, not even go to my assessing officer, should just remain in the directorate of risk assessment. We fought to the nail. And today is the same society, same governments are discussing to make it public. Public. Now, now, therefore, to me, it's a great opportunity for businesses to consider what approach do they want to follow in creating an equation with their stakeholders, whether these are customers, vendors, financiers, employees, and other stakeholders, including mm -hmm. the governments in India and overseas. 
and if their decision is they want to proactively engage with them so that the equation remains the way they want the equation to be seen and not leave it to the imagination that okay you are paying 5% tax it means you must be highly aggressive taxpayer and must be cutting corner if you are paying 25% tax you must have a lousy tax department paying 25% tax so that's the imagination so are you wanting to leave it to the imagination of the analyst and your stakeholder or are you wanting to control it and if you want to control it then a publishable tax strategy document encompassing what uh, ajay said and what the standards say in respect of this become important i agree with your point rahul but i feel that is every company rightly right now are they prepared for disclosing all their tax strategies and policies in the public domain even without a requirement from the government should they do it should they just wait as amit said that should they wait for the regulations to come up so that i think it's a matter of exactly, choice it's a matter of choice exactly what has to be reported maybe yeah. i think they can wait and decide no i would just to add uh, add neha one thing in terms of reporting standards on the tax matters there is virtually a gold standard which is finding mm-hmm. convergence in international businesses which is gri 202207 right and therefore i don't see that there is a risk of the reporting leading to confusion in the minds of the people on the other mm-hmm. hand it is the management decision as to whether we want to avail of this now or not and in mm-hmm. a competitive world i have seen that when it was the requirement to disclose whether your product is made of the fat which is trans fat or which is futa fat etc people voluntarily disclose that Mm-hmm. because they thought that the stickiness of the customer and the stakeholder would be higher similarly here if you recognize it as a business advantage then and only then you need to do that otherwise even if the government prescribes it you would still follow a very minimalistic approach to do just about the compliance and may lose that business advantage exactly exactly and we can draw some uh, inference from the fact that the brsr report which is the report required for esg compliance which has been defined the government has clearly come out with the fact that if you are following some global standard for this esg reporting you can continue to follow that and just fill in the gaps based the brsr report so even the government is aware that the global standards that they are going to follow in india are almost similar so if that's the case for brsr report we can draw some inference from that and uh, start using the tax transparency report formats available in the public domain which are being followed globally so if the company voluntary want they can and they should i think that's what my view is great example you picked up ajay for this i would say another uh, sector company sipla is another example just in few months back 2020 they supported a report which has a full disclosure on the tax transparency aspect of their taxes mm-hmm. and their rate of tax etc etc uh, so there are companies which have already started taking early steps in this and and that's the matter of choice that every company would make to my mind somebody would like to get into it faster because they see greater business advantage and greater nexus so amit now coming to the capacity building for this uh, this new taxes esg reporting may inside benchmarking with corporate themselves that is this they shall be comparing themselves to the competitors and striving to be better at present it is challenging for investors to understand where the esg risk in a portfolio when evaluation tools are relatively blunt because carbon intensity is one yardstick don't you think the esg gaining traction development of tools such as esg rating and tax score should be accelerated as as you mentioned that there should be an award for the highest tax payer uh, the com- the government recognizes that but they don't give an award so do you think that esg rating and tax score should be accelerated uh in my view uh, you know uh, you have picked up the right thing uh you know uh, this is something today which is not very much formalized Mm-hmm. we have uh, guidelines international guidelines and uh, you know other things available but uh, if you ask uh, most of the corporates today in india uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, formalizing the document in terms of creating the documents are not fully prepared 
although they they have everything in place they are doing uh, the esg compliance internally everything is happening their tax policies are uh, you know they have as tax sops and everything in place but what is what is to be what should be the formal outcome of the document today in the absence of any clear cut guideline which is missing and that mm-hmm. is the problem most of the corporates are facing so right. as as you rightly said in my view government should come out with some kind of a, a scorecard or some kind of a parameters on which the esg contribution of a corporate should be evaluated mm-hmm. that's that's right. my personal view i agree with your view to a certain extent i agree so ajay to you uh, shareholders are advocating for net zero policies and for tighter linkages between esg targets and executive compensation packages as well so the socially conscious consumers are more inclined to vote with their wallets encouraging businesses to reappraise their products and purpose including their role as employer to diverse engage workforces worldwide governments too are according tax incentives to promote esg activities is india you think uh, is india lagging behind do corporates need more government support to be uh, to be pushed to become more esg uh, conscious or compliant i i really can't speak on behalf of the government whether you know uh, government is making enough policy for the corporates to be far more esg compliant or not but you know if i look at uh, you know whether it's a current government or the past governments if you look at the policy framing since i have been the student of tax uh, based on the needs the indian tax policies have been drafted and crafted let me give you a few examples probably that will help you know uh, way back in uh, 90s we had something called athc uh, mm-hmm. for goods manufactured and export in order to get you know foreign currency into india so you get some export benefits for technology companies for software companies we had something called athhe uh, for infrastructure development back in 2000 we had something called you know telecom uh, companies were provided atia some infrastructure companies were provided atia benefit then we had some location specific benefits for instance if you set up a shop in uh, northeastern states you will get uh, you know 10 out of 15 or 20 years of benefit likewise you know whole host of benefits were provided uh acc benefits were also there it continues to be there that you know you set up shop in an acc uh location you get these benefits so based on what the need of the country is where the country is lacking i think the tax policies are been drafted in that direction another you know couple of examples uh, you know look at uh, solar you know you mm-hmm. take uh, you build your solar power you get certain both gst benefits are rationalized you have some direct tax benefits also look at the you know solid waste management you know you uh, uh, better manage your uh, waste you get some tax benefit so keeping all these factors in mind uh, you know probably is the right time for government to look at some kind of incentives mm-hmm. to companies who are esg compliant i don't want to trespass a route where you know companies should be penalized for not having you know uh, not complying with sec uh, regulations or whatever the standards are because right now there are not many standards available therefore penalizing someone who doesn't understand the law very well or there is no prescribed law it doesn't make sense i think the business environment will anyways going to become quite competitive the moment you provide benefits to mm-hmm. companies who are esg compliant and mm-hmm. i think uh, probably that may be the uh, right course of action to my mind to incentivize to provide some sort of a tax benefit to slash down the rates to give some excess let's say you know subsidy some kind of capital investment all sort of things you provide probably you know that will help the industry to be far more esg compliant and conscious mm. i agree with you uh, ajay but i feel that at times the uh, carrot and stick approach is a better approach you have to so as rightly said the government is providing tax credits for renewable energy projects 
countries like australia have tax concessions for clean buildings while in canada there are strong incentives for solar power most developed economies offer sustainable incentives and clearly such tax concessions they serve a highly effective means of channelizing efforts in esg as you mentioned that the companies will be more incentivized to take the right actions if they have the incentive the tax incentive whether it's in the form of a rate cut or a or a tax benefit however with global climate crisis and the social issues from diversity and inclusion to wage equality gaining importance i have a question for you rahul punishments for those businesses. we can't hear you neha i'm sorry am i audible now yeah yeah yes. i am so sorry i don't know where i where you lost me so i'll just repeat a little uh, last two lines so the most developing economies offer uh, sustainability in incentives and clearly such tax concessions serve as highly effective means of channelizing efforts in esg as uh, ajay mentioned so rahul b i uh, want your views on uh, the this whole global climate uh, crisis social issues from diversity and inclusion of wage equality gaining importance do you see the equation flipping do you see tax punishments replacing incentives for those businesses who do not pursue or in, invest in more sustainable modes of business considering the urgency in the dire climatic situation can we expect new regulations and new taxes like a, a new kind of plastic tax or a, or something like that maybe do you think something like this will happen so whether we like it or not you you have a situation in the globally interconnected economy if consider what is being debated in the eu parliament as carbon taxes right so the government of india might like to say that we would want to incentivize something but if globally where your customers are situated and where your vendors are situated if those governments and those tax regimes want to punish you you will get punished mm -hmm. and that punishment is not to my mind be treated as a punishment that should be treated as a nudge for a certain behavior that's mm. number 1 number 2 not making available an incentive to somebody itself is a punishment right right so because you have a economic disadvantage in terms of that the third thing i would do say is whether the tax incentives are the best way of delivering the support for economic health in transition of businesses or to achieve a purpose there is a debate on that mm -hmm. and there are lots of research done on that and it is not conclusively proven that tax incentives lead to it and we have a great example in india we have had the telecom exemptions as i mentioned and we saw the revolution in the telecom and we have had the power exemptions which were even far more years and decades longer than the telecom exemption and we didn't see any movement there mm -hmm. right so so it's a, it's a it's a debatable question as to whether tax is the right mode of delivering the support to businesses and to my mind given that debate let's not risk the public money mm -hmm. and therefore if it is a matter of incentivizing a business look at things like pli look at things of direct subsidy that i just mentioned and not necessarily clutter the tax laws with reference mm -hmm. to that so my view would be there would definitely be an approach which would follow both the carrot and stick approach and it would be interconnected with global economy and therefore you would need to be careful to see whether you are aware as to what is happening in the jurisdiction on these taxes as you said the taxes on waste taxes on plastic taxes on landfill mm -hmm. carbon taxes disposal taxes etc what is happening in those countries from where your stakeholders come and a right. vigilant tax department and you use the expression creating capacity to my mind that's an important capacity building in classical tax departments that how do you deal with the new taxes how do you gather the information about these new taxes from the key jurisdiction where your main stakeholders are situated so your views on this amit uh, 
I think the government is very clear they don't want to offer more incentives. Rather, they are taking away the incentives currently in place in the tax laws. Do you think uh, you can expect some tax in incentives for companies who are more ESG conscious and compliant? No, as you rightly said, Neha, government in recent past, we have seen they are taking away all the incentives, phasing out all the past deduction we used, which we used to have under Section 10 AA Chapter 6A. And now they are coming with more flatter tax rate of, uh, you know, maybe 22% tax rate, 15% tax rate. Now, going back to the philosophy of incentivizing uh, things. Uh, I, it, it is it is up to the government whether they want to incentivize or not. But uh, in my view, you know, uh, in India or in many developing countries, as Rahul mentioned, tax has been used as a tool for economic development. Mm. And, and it is being used very widely. And uh, I would say that if there is some some direct incentives provided to the taxpayers or uh, or any corporate for complying uh, with the ESG, be it voluntary or mandatory, uh, you know, we could see a more, more, you know, ESG compliant uh, society. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is my view. But, but, you know, we, I can't say uh, much about that. But if something is there, it's, it's, it's going to be good for the corporates. Mm -hmm. So any concluding remarks from you, Ajay, what is your final view that ESG as a tax, the tax aspects of ESG, they're gaining uh, importance in the boardroom and we can see the co corporates are also well prepared in the sense not to act right now, but they are in that thinking process that this, they have to be prepared, they ta their tax policies, their tax strategies have to be in place, they have to be, uh, they can't be too aggressive, they can't be too uh, uh, as in easy or lousy going, but they have to be a balanced approach. They are answerable to public. So what is your final view? Since Vedanta is already so compliant, we can see the tax transparency report to be so extensive. And it, as you mentioned, ESG is anyways a, a topic or a touch point on any discussion on any financial matter discussion also. So any uh, comment from you that you think that this will be the way uh, you know, uh, as as the saying goes, that you know, it's it's good if the uh, taxes rather would look good when the bad behavior is taxed and uh, uh, good behavior is sort of incentivized. Mm. So uh, I'm I'm really not so sure, you know, how uh, the government is going to act on the tax incentive when it comes to ESG compliant company or ESG non compliant country uh, companies, but the important aspect continues to be that ESG is far beyond tax. Mm -hmm. uh, tax may be one of the component of you to be ESG compliant or, you know, to look, uh, you know, progress towards ESG or take certain steps towards ESG. But without ESG, you are actually challenging, without being ESG compliant, you are actually challenging your existence itself. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we work with Mother Nature quite extensively in India. And it is not only our financial responsibility, to my mind, it is our moral responsibility also to really take care of Mother Earth in a manner that, you know, uh, future generation can take benefit of uh, uh, our work in the future. Or mm -hmm. if, if we can't improve it, at least we should not destroy it, what we have really, you know, uh, gathered. So to my mind, you know, uh, a lot, we have to wait and watch, you know, how the governments are going to react irrespective of the behavior of the government, the policy of the government framing towards ESG and all. I think most of the companies are or rather have started their journey towards being more sustainable and bo more inclusion, inclusive towards ESG. Mm -hmm. So therefore, tax could be a good, you know, uh, cherry on the cake but not necessarily a determining factor in terms of uh, how you want to do business uh, from an ESG framework perspective. Thanks. And Amit, any final uh, comments from you for your uh, colleagues here that how you see ESG tax aspects gaining importance? Yeah, Nia, so, uh, from my side, I would say that we have already moved to a situation where uh, the question has turned from what is your profit to how you have earned that profit? 
mm. and uh, growth to a responsible growth situation exactly. and i'm sure that uh, most of the corporates are already doing the same thing they are complying with uh, the environmental guidelines they are contributing to the society giving back to the society and uh, you know from the tax point of view uh, you know most of the corporates have well defined transparent tax policies in place it's a matter of time that uh, when they come up whether voluntarily or mandatorily as rahul said it is up to their choice uh, but but i would say you know esg is is you know is gaining importance and uh, people should people should start thinking if they have not already started that how to how to do that uh, disclosures etc right and your views rahul uh, what do you think uh, you want as a takeaway for the uh, the clients that how should they view esg should they uh, wait and watch or should they take a voluntary action towards this so my view is anchored on this that i see tax being a differentiator opportunity for businesses to establish themselves in esg and therefore i recommend a voluntary and advanced approach rather than wait and watch number one number two i also bucket the takeaways in two sections one which are very very critical which are matter of life and death for business which means that do you have a listing of your key stakeholder and which territories they come from both your vendors customers and financiers and then test it on a periodical basis what are the esg related tax developments in those territories and you might suddenly find that the carbon taxes on import of steel from india because it is made of the fossil fuel is so high that your competitive advantage goes so that's a matter of life and death to my mind and businesses must in any case be prepared to see that and create system and capacity within the organization to deal with that the second the point that amit made everybody is conscious of this everybody is doing a lot on this within the organization but in the absence of guidance in the absence of prescription of guidelines people are not transparently publishing it or not everybody is publishing it. and that's the second bucket of it to which i would say that this should continue to happen and people should look at the global standards because it is very likely that the indian standards also as we have seen in other recent matters whether it is ifrs or lease accounting etc would be aligned with the global standards and we have the global standards for saying what is your total tax contribution how do you compare yourself with peer group what is your tax strategy and how do you publish it there are fairly robust global standards which have been practiced over more than 10 years and therefore we should look at them and this is again an aspect of capacity building within the tax department i couldn't agree more and uh, thank you so much i am really obliged to have uh, all of you on my panel and we've been able to discuss so such important and intricate issues uh, governing a company who has to now look at esg as a main agenda one of the main agendas in their boardroom be conscious of the effect it has on their stakeholders the investors are very conscious of how you are placed on the esg yardstick so if you're looking at any investment you need to be conscious of that fact so all these things just reinforces the fact that yes esg is a very very important issue for companies to look at and tax transparency is the governance part of that esg environment is one part social is another the tax transparency is equally important to showcase a, a a true picture of your company showcase how you are your tax strategies are in place how you are following the the tax planning strategies are are in compliance with the law so to showcase a good picture about your company the true picture about your company this is your opportunity so Thank i just want so to add Sarit. one thing that businesses are seen as trees and tax is the oxygen that the tree gives so yeah. your stakeholders are watching what is the oxygen that you are giving for society right. very rightly put travel very rightly so thank you avinash for giving us this opportunity over to you thank you very much uh, uh, so 
that brings us to the end of this first day of this program and uh, on behalf of SHM, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to Neha as a session moderator and uh, our panelists for this session, Mr. Rahul Garg, Mr. Ajay Agrawal and Mr. Amit Mishra for sharing their views on this uh, tax aspect of ESG. I would like to thank all the attendees for uh, attending this session and would request you to kindly join tomorrow at 4 o'clock because tomorrow we'll be having three sessions. So look forward to have you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.